Here's Denny and Tony today of the Tech Firm. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tony. Good to have you back, Tony. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so it's a, it's one of those weird things, weird, you know, uncommon situations where we can actually get you at home as mm -hmm. opposed to be on the road again. Yep. Um, so today we're going to be talking about span ports and tabs. I cannot believe that we're still talking about this, that, 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 that the industry still needs something to talk about. I just look it up. The paper that, that uh, Tim O'Neill wrote on span port versus tab was, was, uh, was published on August 23rd, 2007, almost 10 years ago. Wow. So, so let's start by by asking you then, Tony. Why, why you you obviously want to you, you wrote an article and you obviously want to talk about this because you see something in the industry that 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 you feel that that need to be addressed. Yep. Yeah. There's. Uh, I think there's there's two things. And uh, the first thing is, I'm surprised how many people in the last few years uh, still don't quite understand the role of a tap and what a tap does and what it doesn't do um, and some of the implications uh, of having a tap and Tim and I have talked about this many times where some people don't understand they have a problem and whatever tool they plug in any tool doesn't matter Wireshark, tap, hub, switch, doesn't matter whatever you add to the mix during the problem gets blamed as part of the problem so um, you know and, and the specific example Tim and I have talked about many times is uh, customers claiming that we plugged a tap in and it's causing a problem or reduced their bandwidth further or, or done something like that, um, which is furthest from the truth. You happen to be having a problem and I happen to have connected something during the problem and it's not part of the problem, it's trying to fix the problem. So I want to talk about the role of the tap and secondarily, because I kind of went on a rant there so I apologize, but no. the second part of it is I talk about span versus tap but with a different type of twist. People uh, have talked a lot about what packets you see, what packets you don't see uh, and packets dropped which is fine, that's, that's great but what I don't see a lot of is the latency implication of tap versus span and, and what I mean by that, just in a nutshell, I'll get into this in just a moment, is that the span versus tap I guess argument if you want to call it that um, has a different connotation to it and what I mean by that is hey guess what I'm gonna send you a thousand packets a hundred thousand packets you may get them you'll get them all and people say well then I'm good well no because the the space between the packets may not be accurate and true and I'm using the word may because mileage will vary depending on your equipment and all that kind of jazz but for the most part uh, spanning a port gives you a totally different profile of that packet latency than a tap would and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why it matters and why it doesn't matter, but I wanted to talk about it with a fresh new look because I find that this little, this whole latency thing isn't really touched on much, which to me is becoming a bigger issue. It is a key mm -hmm. issue today. Mm -hmm. Hey, so, so before Tony uh, gets a little bit um, uh, more in depth with today's subject, Tim, why don't you give us a perspective on this as well? Well, I'm an empirical Without engineer. insulting anyone. I won't insult anybody. <laughs> I mean, if I insult Tony, that's okay. We're friends. <laughs> no, I'm an empirical engineer. And when I want to look at something with an oscilloscope, a counter, you know, a spectrum analyzer, I'm assuming uh, that I want to look at it with the best accuracy. I don't want it to say that it's under 10 kilohertz or it's over a gigahertz. I want to know what it is exactly. And... When in 1976, 77, we started building taps for RS-232 because we really wanted to see, you know, all of the ASCII and EPSIDIC going by or BODO or HEX or whatever. They're big, very different protocols back in those days. And um, to me, the only view that you needed was a real view, in real time as much as close as possible. There is no real time in, in a quantum sense, but it's close enough. Uh, and then back in 1993 when we were at the Sniffer Network General Corporation um, and we got into Ethernet looking at it in real time became an imperative of course real time back then we had a, a lot lower bandwidth so it was a lot easier uh, but immediately we saw how important looking at every bit byte Octec in there uh, was important I mean 
you do want to know if you got bad frames. You do want to know if you've got uh, bad CRCs. You do want to know what if anybody's mucked with your inner frame gap. Um, and I, I mean, just as a one example, not too many months ago, a guy called me up and everything was going crazy in his network. Everything was dying. He was losing frames. He had retransmissions out the wazoo, and it all had been working a week before perfectly. And one of his engineers, who was new, thought that, well, heck, if I can save a few extra bits after every frame, the inner frame gap, he reduced the inner frame gap size. Well, the inner frame gap was put there to help us stop collisions, okay? And by doing that, he put it into a fault mode that they were losing uh, sometimes as many as 30% of their frames going into collision mode, which meant everybody had to restart retransmitting and uh, and especially today with all the real-time protocols we have you want to look at it in as close as to what's going on in the network as possible and Tony mentioned delay well you know you, you want to know if there's actually delay if there are timing issues and you can't do that with span span was never span is a marketing tool uh, that someone thought was it was originally span was a diagnostic access to switches that someone in marketing said hey if we make this available to customers we can claim it's more you know bigger product but if you read even Cisco's disclaimer it says yeah this isn't real time and you're gonna lose frames because what's the priority of a switch okay priority of a switch is not to give you packets to look at prior to switch is to get the right frames to the right IP address um, and to do anything else that needs to be done. And it's just amazing to me. And again, I'm an old engineer. You know, I look at a cable as a, a inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor, uh, which most people just think I'm crazy, which is true probably. But mm -hmm. Tony, this is so important to me because just in, like you said, just in the last two weeks, we've had two major incidents where people have said that, you know, uh, put a tap in and it caused problems on my network, which is totally untrue. As a matter of fact, the span port probably could cause more problems, many more problems than a tap could ever cause. And I'm just delighted that somebody took, you know, we've had Tony write articles, I've written articles, Mike's written, Michael Pinocchi's written articles, uh, Chris Greer's written articles, um, and like you said, Denny, this goes back 10 years. Actually, I wrote my first paper back before we really had the Internet. It was actually done on a Macintosh and uh, printed out and copied. Don't giggle, Tony. Uh, and <laughs> so this has been a real long problem, and I still see it every, literally every day. Someone makes some comment about it, and it's major. And it's, it just, it, you know, and people like Tony that are professional analysts, uh, I know it must drive them crazy. I mean, Tony's going to be balder than me eventually. <laughs> yeah, right. So Okay, well, know. with that, Tony, um, uh, we don't need to rush. Uh, we, can, we can take our time. Uh, this is an important uh, uh, technical subject that I think that we don't want to rush through this. So go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You have the floor. Yeah, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to I'm going to cover this various different ways. I'm going to just start with a couple of PowerPoint slides. And I, I think what's really important is... I do want to cover um, those those few examples where a span port is actually fine, uh, because there are some times when you could use a span port and it's not a big deal. Uh, and one good example is a, I had a customer a few weeks ago who said, "I've got my my fiber connection between two buildings, and I just want to know what the top talkers are or the top applications are, um, that sort of." And if you miss a packet or two and the timings off, it doesn't really matter because it's still you know, Joe is still downloading whatever off the internet and that's still relevant information. Even some IDS boxes, they just want to know who's attacking, who's talking, that sort of thing. Um, you know, sure, why not? Use a spam port. Uh, but, you know, those are very specific examples with specific devices and you're probably going to span a port. And Tim and I, you know, we've talked about this many times before, uh, spanning an entire VLAN, not a great idea. Um, even spanning two ports may not be a great idea. Um, then, then there's a whole remote span, and I'm not going to get into all that, but the point is there are some, some specific examples where this is a good idea, and it does fit, right? So in this example, this is a, a PowerPoint slide I used for that article that I wrote, 
And I, I wanted to make sure I covered this first slide because it kind of summarizes everything I'm going to go through. And, and Tony, we're gonna we're gonna put that um, PowerPoint up on the on the on the article, right? Oh yeah, sure, okay. good idea. Yeah, I didn't okay. Even that. Yeah, let's right. do that because uh, I just need to, you know, there, there, there's there's a golden rule for PowerPoint presentation: never use font size half smaller than half of the average age of audience. Ah. <laughs> I gotta use that. That's good. All right. Because I can't see anything right now. <laughs> oh no, kidding. But don't, but don't worry. Don't worry. Right. Just, uh, just, just don't do that. And I just, I, I just say that because there are people uh, watching live right now, <laughs> and I, I want them to know that we will put up this PowerPoint. Sure, <laughs> Tim with his magnifying yeah. glass. All right, I'll read a couple of points for you people over the age of thirty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. the primary, the primary goal of this lab. Is the document latency right? That was the that was the goal of the lab. And if other stuff comes out of it, that's fantastic. The methodology to me is quite important, and the reason why methodology is important is because net, it leads to people trying to reproduce this in their environment, which is fantastic. Uh, do you do you need to use the exact same tools? No, no. The methodology is more important than the tools, I think. Uh, so in this case, I generated 100,000 frames, and I generated it using a Fluke Networks, or now it's called NetScout, an OptiView XG. And we'll go through the details in just a few more slides. And I only want to generate a 9% load, because this is the other thing that I run into a lot. People read these span tap articles, and they say, well, the guy generated 99% uh, load on 1 gig or 10 gig Ethernet, and my gig is running at 5%. So I'm never going to have a problem, so get lost. And you know what? They might be right, but they might not be right. So I wanted to show you with just 9% load what I found out. All right? And then again, this is just me and my environment with my gear. Um, I also chose the OptiView because it has a 10 nanosecond resolution. So it's important to understand when you have a packet analyzer or you're going to capture packets, how accurate is it? Because I've done this a lot of times in all my Wireshark uh, workshops where you generate packets and you'll have a Microsoft machine. And sometimes it's only accurate to a millisecond or five milliseconds, depending, again, the driver, the PC, and all that kind of stuff, right? So then the remaining trace file was filtered out, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, what was cool was the OptiView, when it transmits packets, in the IP header, there's something called an identifier. And the identifier for, for, for the OptiView was the exact same for every packet. So that made filtering super easy. I just filtered on that identifier number, and I had all the packets. Because sometimes, you know, my machine will ARP, or you'll get the odd other you know, miscellaneous pack. We don't need that. So it's a great way to filter it out if we need to, right? The trace file was then converted to a CSV file. And then basically I graph the results using Excel. And it's that simple. So if you want to use your own packet generator and you want to do the same thing, knock yourself out, right? So the order of the tests were quite important. Uh, the first test I always like to do is a back-to-back -back test. That's my baseline. So that's two OptiViews with a piece of copper, no switch, no nothing, right? So then I get my variance. So it's between 68 and 69 microseconds. That's my range of my latency, if you want to call it that. Some people will also call it jitter. For the purposes of this write-up, it's the same. They're analogous. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the switch, when we introduce the switch, you can see what happened. All of a sudden, my 68 to 69 microseconds becomes 56 to 80. See that? Um, so that's kind of a, a big deal, only because, there you go, I made it a little bigger for everybody. So <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, saw, I saw Tim's eyes melting as he was <laughs> And then, and now I can you can quickly compare your baseline, right, with what happens when a switch is involved. And again, this is the switch that I use. Now you got to remember something. This is in my lab, and there's nothing on the switch, nothing. So in a real environment with real packets and real broadcasts, you know this may be better, worse, who knows, right? Then the tap gets introduced, and you can see it's 55 to 80. So if the switch was 56 to 80, and the tap was 55 to 80. I'm going to say the introduction of the tap was quite negligible, right? And lastly, the span port. The span port went from 50 to 88. And you can see 56 to 80 becomes 50 to 88. Obviously, quite the change. So even now, if you look at this little summary, just these four bullets, it kind of summarizes everything in a nutshell. And what I don't want people to do, because I've had people do this, and it's I think this is an IT thing, guys. Uh, you see the number, and you say, well, then that's what I must have, and that's not true. I'm trying to explain to you this is what I had, 
And if you want to go back and check your environment, knock yourself out. Because I've been in some places where you introduce a span port and the delay is milliseconds, not microseconds, milli, right? And so this, this is something you need to just, again, remember, your mileage will vary. That's what I keep telling people, right? That's right. So yeah. on to the next slide. So what did I use? I used my OptiView, right? Uh, that's my traffic generator and my capture tool. I used a Cisco 3750 switch with some patch cables, real simple. This is kind of like, you know, when you watch the cooking show and they go through the ingredients? This is kind of like what I'm telling you, right? Then I had a Garland tap, and I also had a Profi tap, tap, if you want to call it that. And they're a little different, so I wanted to kind of see if they both behave the same way. And, you know, spoiler alert, they, they were the same, which is great to know. Uh, the traffic generator, this is where I tell people you got to pay attention if you want to reproduce this with your own stuff, then pay attention to this kind of stuff. For example, I had no, Q no QoS. You can see it says normal here in the center of the screen. I did not touch that, so I left that alone because I don't care about QoS right now. If you want to take this further and measure the impact of QoS, hey, go ahead, knock yourself out. At 100,000 frames, the frame size was only 757 bytes. Again, some of these tests that people run are full-size packets, and people will argue not all my packets are full-size, therefore this doesn't apply to my environment, right? That's the kind of mentality which I keep struggling against. The next thing is the utilization. Again, only 9% load. So only a 9% load on a 1 gig link and a frame size approximately half of the maximum frame size that you would find on 10 100 Ethernet. Now, with gig, there's jumbo frames. I'm not going to get into that right now. But the point is this, is, this is a relatively conservative, if not really low end of the scale as far as packet size and utilization goes. So in some environments, you'll have a higher utilization, a higher average packet size. Well, then there you go. You can adjust accordingly. Okay. So on the capture side, this is really important. I've had a lot of people email me this, this simple question that tends to be a big topic, and that's packet slicing. Now, packet slicing simply means that when you have a full-size packet arrive, in this case, that 757 size packet, right? 155, excuse me, 757, I'll get it out, right? When that arrives, I don't want it all. I don't need the entire packet. And, and the reason why I do that is because later on in Excel, I don't want a big, huge file to crunch through Excel. So what I did was I sliced it. I only took the first 64 bytes. That's good enough. I don't need more than that. That's, that's more than enough data. So when we do a lot of performance testing and in my performance classes, I tell people you should really think about packet slicing because it will save you a lot of time, space, processing, and brain cells if you don't need the whole packet. And, and it's, it's also... Yeah, I'm sorry, Tony. And it's also a security feature. If you don't need yeah. to give out all the data, yeah. it's, you can still look at what's actually happening in the network without actually seeing anything that could be proprietary or dangerous. Exactly. Right on. Tim just stole my thunder. Awesome. So, no, it's cool. <laughs> Scary when we're on, we're on the same page. So, yeah, yes. sometimes you want to slice the packet when you're not allowed to see the data, right? And sometimes you slice the packet when you're never going to be able to read the data, such as encrypted data and that sort of thing, all right? So the point is, I slice the packet. That's the point. It doesn't affect the test in any way, shape, or form. It's just affecting the way I'm collecting the data. That's all, all right? So the methodology is real simple. I can start my capture from all three OptiViews when required, or just two when they're back-to-back, -back, right? I start my traffic generation from one OptiView to another. I collect my trace file or files. Then I run the XG cleanup script. Now, this is really important. So if you are capturing packets from a device, as part of your test, you should have a script or a procedure where you delete stuff. And the reason why you want to do that simply, you don't want to lose track of what you got, and you don't want to fill up a drive and then run out of space through a critical test. It's real simple. Just a simple batch file to delete them or just highlight them and explore and delete them, whatever it is. But please delete your trace files. And I, and I can't stress that enough. That's a big deal. Then we filter out n unnecessary packets, and we save our filter trace file as whatever filter.cap. So I have a standard naming convention. Again, that's very important when we troubleshoot. Right? Naming conventions will, again, save a lot of time in the future. Then we export that trace file to a CSV file, and then we crunch through them in Excel. So again, our first test, back to back, just a piece of copper or even a piece of fiber. It, it doesn't matter, right? 
Um, and this is this is incredibly important that you do this baseline first. Uh, people will go back and do this later, which really messes up your whole methodology and your findings and your logic, right? So this is a good thing to do. Um, I'll be honest with you, I never do one test, right? Minimum is five. You drop the high, you drop the low, and you average three. That's usually what I do. Sounds like a lot, not really. When you have a methodology and you've got a standard way of doing things, and if you're really lucky and you can write a script, this is a no-brainer. This is not a big deal. This is an extra five minutes. This is not an extra day's worth of effort. Okay? Shouldn't be. And then there you can see there's my chart and it looks like a big box and that's how tight the variance was. You can see here, again, I don't know how good your eyes are, the bottom of the scale says 68 microseconds. The top of the scale was 69 microseconds. That's the scale we're looking at here. One microsecond variance. So some people will even say, well that could just be the wire. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, that's what it is. But the point is, this is consistent. That's the point, right? It's consistent. So back to back, we're proving that one device can generate the load. The other device can actually capture the load. We're proving it. And this is important because if you can't keep up, it's okay. As long as you know what the baseline looks like, you know what you're working from, okay? So even if the range was a millisecond, that's fine doesn't mean the test is null and void. Again, that's our baseline. It's, it's okay, right? And this is, this is one of the many questions I've been asked since I've posted my article. People say, I'm only using Microsoft or Linux or iPerf. You know, is it okay? And yeah, yeah, everything is okay if it's consistent and documented, right? So there you go. So there's a traffic to the switch, and this is quite important. So on the left-hand side, we got our device. This is literally, these are my lab notes, folks. Now, you know, I've obviously used pretty little pictures for the PowerPoint, but this is what I scribble on paper, little drawings, little boxes. And look, I write down the port number, 27. I write down blue. Well, blue is the, literally the color of the cable, <laughs> right? Because when you're sitting there and there's a rat's nest, the cable's plugged into a switch, it'd be nice to know you just grab the blue one, right? Or look, the pink one on the right side or the yellow one on the top. If all three were blue, then I would have, guess what, a little more work to do, which is just frustrating, okay? I also document the name of the devices, in this case, the OptiView XG names, and the IP of the devices. That way, no matter how I look at the data, no matter how I want to move the devices around, it's simple, it's consistent, it's not a big deal, all right? Some people ask me what happens when you run out of colors, and I say, well, then you should be doing something else because it's getting way too complicated, right? So this is simple. We're going to blast some packets from the left-hand switch with the IP address of 104 to the right-hand switch, which is 101. So for all intents and purposes, this top switch is doing nothing, right? Because the switch, if it works properly, will take those packets and that MAC address for that destination device on port 29 and send it just to him, and that's it, right? So if you did want to look at other things like flooding and all that kind of jazz, knock yourself out, but it's that's not what we're doing here, right? Because that's the other thing IT people tend to do is there's a little ADD going on and they try to change gears in mid-flight. Stop that. Just finish one thing at a time and you'll be all right, okay? So that's the result through the actual switch, which is a huge difference in departure from what we saw from the big block that I showed you a moment ago, right? So now the range is 56 to 80 microseconds. And you can see how the switch has inserted some latency, right, some delay, which is not bad. It's not good. It's the way it is, right? So if you said, hey, Tone, go run a mile, and it took me 30 minutes, that's not bad or good. That's just my time. If I don't like it, I can go do something about it. But at least I got something to work from, right? And that's what this is. So this is what we're working from. So this is, again, two of those OptiViews, one generating, one receiving, right, or transmit, receive, and then that's it. No span, no tap, no nothing. Again, I have yet another baseline, right? This is the baseline through the switch, and that's why I titled it as such. It says Cisco Switch Dash Baseline. Again, I didn't do one. I did five. I dropped the low, I dropped the high, I averaged three. Because even, especially on a real network, folks, you know this, Every moment the network changes, the behavior changes. Not so much in the lab, but in the real world, right? Like this is a big deal, right? So then I went and I inserted this little tap uh, called a Profi Shark from a company called Profi Tap, 
And it's a different kind of device because you put it between, in this case, the OptiView and the switch, and it's connected to my machine not via Ethernet. That's really important. It's connected via USB, USB 3.0 to be exact, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a different type of tap, and I wanted to see how it behaved. So in this case, again, we're generating from the left to the right, and I'm capturing the packets, right? And now you can see I overlaid what was being transmitted by the device on the left, and I overlaid it with what was being received on the device on the right. And you can see those little yellow, see the little orange, I'm sorry, I said yellow, orange tips everywhere? That's the added latency. So it's not that far off from what the switch was doing. So the blue stuff is the switch, if you will, what was being sent. And then obviously the orange stuff is what was being actually received through the tap. So there, there's very little latency being provided by that tap, which is important to know. So that, quote unquote, that was good. In my opinion, that was pretty good. That was pretty close. And then guess what? We had a little tap. I got one from Garland. Nice little copper tap. You just plug her in. Same deal, right? And you can see, again, those little orange, little orange spikies, little bits, little extra bits. That's the extra latency added by the Tony? Tony, you just dropped out. Uh, now, Tony's been having problems in his area. Let's just give him a second. He'll get back on. If not, we'll... And I, and I think, Denny, while you're doing that, I'll talk for a second. People tend to be very polarized by this. And um, for years, we've, we've had this discussion. And it really shouldn't be a discussion. If you want a true view, a real view of your network, um, you know, you do need to have a tap, especially when timing is an essential element in your uh, testing or disclosure. Um, one thing I'll mention also is a tap cannot be hacked. It does not have an IP presence. Okay. Tony is back. Oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> no, it has to happen. It has to happen once. Yeah, at least to me, right? Yeah. But, uh, no, it, uh, no, I'm not kidding. It's it's. Uh, anyway, um, so do you remember where you, do you remember where you where you where you left? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. okay, okay, good. I'm just, I'm just sharing my screen but, again. But 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 before that, Tim, go ahead and finish your thought. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say is a nice thing about a tap is it's not an IP present device, so it can't be hacked. Where, uh, you know, span ports, routers, switches, whatever, they can be hacked, um, and they can actually be mistakes made in the programming. Uh, several years ago, I wrote an article about a, a programmable device, and I purposely made two errors. Uh, and to this date, I think it's been six years ago, five and six years ago, and no one's ever actually called me or sent me an email and said, hey, no wonder that wouldn't work. That was a mistake you made in the command line programming of that device. Right. So so you can make mistakes and you can cause your uh, diagnostics to be off even more. So, sorry, Tony, go ahead. Oh, no, that's cool. Yeah. And and again, that's a, that's a really good point, Tim. I didn't even talk about that. That's a really good point. Taps really can't be hacked. Um, again, it depends on the tap, and if your management port isn't secured and all that, then that's another thing. But just generally speaking, not really, right? right. So here's the span part. Again, we have our device on the left generating our traffic to the device on the right. So now we're actually capturing with the device on the right, but also capturing from the guy on the top with the span port, right? right. So we're going to have, again, two streams to compare, which is kind of important. And for the people who want to know, this this became a big deal with IT people. What command did you use? And did you do this? And did you do that? And I said, listen, all I did was a default monitor session command. Now, people will start to complain about ingress versus egress and all. Most people, 99% of the IT people out there I've ever seen use a monitor session command, use the defaults. So I want to capture what the majority of the people are doing. Yes, there are different ways of doing this. That's not the point of the article, right? Because, again, IT people tend to get a little carried away with, I call, extra details. <laughs> and here we go. So now this looks like a completely different pattern than we've seen to date. And you can see the orange parts now are much larger. So when the packets are arriving at the same time, there's a lot more latency. But now, again, 
If you look, there's extra orange lines between the blue lines. That means they're even arriving at different times, right? So this is kind of important to understand that not only when they arrive at the same time is there more latency, but even between the packets, they are arriving at different times. So this is a big deal, right? And to me, this is kind of what I'm getting at with a lot of people, because a lot of people, will, again, will generate their traffic streams and say, I got 100% of them, and I said, that's fantastic. That is good information. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's irrelevant. I'm saying, as well as 100% of them getting through, what is the variance of latency? When people say it should, or I think, or I read, I'll translate what that means. That means they don't know, and that's fine. That's why we figure these things out, right? So on top of that, what I want to do is I want to change gears for just one moment. I want to go to my Wireshark trace file. Give me a second here. There you go. So now I'm sharing the trace file. And, and again, I just want to show you a couple of things because people have, have attempted to do this and start again asking me questions, which to me is fantastic. I love it when people ask me questions because it proves they've read it and it proves that they're trying this stuff, which is awesome. That's what I want to do, right? Yeah, so in this case, yeah, exactly. So in this case, you can see this is an unfiltered trace file. So you can see some SNMP packets floating around, some DNS stuff. Like this is just everyday traffic from my machine, right? I don't need any of this. So this is why I tell people there's a few things to, to cover right now. The first is it says here packet size limited during capture. That's because they were sliced. Again, people are asking me what this stuff means because they've never seen it before, right? So in Wireshark, it's shown that way. Now, with other protocol analyzers, there'll be a star or a different notation, but it all means the same thing. With Wireshark in particular, I just want to show you exactly what, it, what it's telling you here. In the frame header, now, little news flash, again, this keeps coming up. This is not in the packet. This is not in the frame. This doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. This is not being transmitted on the wire. This is Wireshark's cliff notes. This is what it's just jotting down as it goes through the trace file. It gives the packet a number or a frame number a number, how long is it, and all that kind of stuff, right? But you can see, right, as you go through this, it will tell you things um, such as the frame length. I know that it's 581 bytes, right? But I'm only capturing 64 bytes of that, for example, right? right. So it's telling you that, and, and that's, that's what it's trying to tell you. So for the people who've seen that for the first time, it's, don't worry about it. It's all right, right? That's why you do this. Now you know for the second time. So what I'm going to do is just simply scroll down a little bit, and all of a sudden I see the pattern of 757, right? That, there's my packet size. That's what I said. So now people were asking me, how did you filter this stuff? And as I said earlier, and I'll show you again right now, the IP identifier right here, this is how the IP header, the IP part of the packet, tracks what it's sending. It just sequentially increments these numbers, like a serial number, right? One, two, three, four, five. Well, what Fluke does is it keeps the same identifier. So that's awesome, because now I can just simply right-click on this in Wireshark and apply that as a filter. Now, I have just the transmitted packets, right? And if you take a look here on the bottom, I don't, again, I don't know how good your eyes are. I'm going to tell you what it says. It says packets, 100,035, and displayed was 100,000. So there was 35 extra ones floating around. Now, again, 35 packets isn't the end of the world, but that would really skew my chart, right? Because there would be some extra little bits floating around. So no matter what you use to generate your traffic, learn how to filter on that. Sometimes you can change the payload, right? Put in the payload, uh, load test, latency test, eat at Joe's, whatever, you know, something unique. <laughs> and then that way you can come back later and you can filter on it, or the IP, or the MAC, it doesn't matter. The point is, in my case, I was able to filter on the IP identifier. And just for illustration purposes, if I was to right-click on this, I can also apply this as a column. And now that that field name, the identifier, you can clearly see is always hex 38 or decimal 56, all the way down the line, right? So it doesn't change every so often. Again, some of them might do it in blocks and all that. This is just what I found out about the Fluke OptiView. And it's not right and it's not wrong. It's just what it is. That's just right. what it does. So at the end of the day, if you do create a column, you've never done it before, you don't want it anymore, just right-click on it, column header, 
And then you can you can do a few things. You can hide it, or in this case, I just want to remove it. I'm done with it, right? And then it's gone now. So when you do that, now I can go to File, because again, this is what keeps coming up. People are saying, how do you how do you export this, right? So if I go to Export Specified Packets, a screen will appear, and it says, oh, what do you want to do? This is this is where people make a mistake because they're looking through this list of all the different protocols or formats I can save this as, CSV is not there. So this is one of the more, I'm going to say, common question is, I can't export this as CSV. I don't know how you did that. Well, let me show you. Cancel. File. And I went to the export, right? Because that's usually what people do. Don't do that, <laughs> obviously. So export packet dissections as CSV. You see that? All right. So when you do that, now you can save it as CSV, right? Please pay attention to this packet format area because you might end up with the bytes when you don't want them. You may end up with the details you don't want them, right? If you just want the summary line, you want to make sure, just uncheck them all and leave that one little check. Please make sure you have the displayed because captured, remember those 35 extra ones? We don't want that. We want the displayed because there's a filter on that. And then you just go ahead and give it a name, right? So that's it's, it's quite important that you follow the same methodology every single time. And again, this is not promoting, hey, everybody go buy an OptiView, everybody go buy a Garland, everybody go buy... No, no, just whatever you got, you can do this same test with. Okay? And, uh, and that was it. Wow. That's a uh, Tony, you make some great points. Uh, no matter what you're doing in a, in a scientific environment, you have to stick to the rules which means repeatability uh, and averaging correctly. You know, some people like to go to the low or go to the high end. No, average it out so you know you're kind of in the middle of the ballpark. You know, you make that baseline a little bit larger. Uh, but scientific process is always important. Even if you decide to use SPAN, okay, at least understand what it's doing to your data so if that comes under scrutiny and I'll give you a great point we had a situation for a federal trial not too long ago where the way they captured the data was through a span through a, a vacuum okay so they, they they replicated the VLAN then they use a span port and then they use filtering and when questioned in court the defense really understood what they were doing and called their attention to it. And of course, the guy that did the capture looked at him like, I don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, that the old adage about 12 people that couldn't get out of jury duty, they caught that very quickly. And as a result, the evidence was thrown out because it was not scientifically repeatable. The guy had never done any studies to come up with, yes, this works, we've done these studies and things like that. So it's, it's good to know. Uh, and by the way, one thing I did meant, didn't want I wanted to mention, and you can make a comment on, of course, you're not going to save any time by eliminating your interframe gap. Okay, you're gonna. It's kind of like walking into a minefield. Uh, you might make it, but it's it's not going to be nice. And uh, so, don't ever do that un, yeah. unless you're in an experimental environment and you know what you're doing. Uh, Read. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, how would you like to troubleshoot a network like that and find out that your interframe gap was, uh, uh, you know, 12 bits? Hey, Tony, I, I, was, I was just completely awed by your presentation, and I can't help but to think that, you know, what makes you unique is that everything you do, you know you have to explain it to someone. And yep. so, you, you know, you, I really noticed that is that you think it all through, and you know you you put in a, it, it's really hygiene. You just you put in all these methodology, and and you just say look you know I, maybe they won't ask me, but I'm in the business of, of of teaching other people how to do this, so I do it this way. And I think this is a, actually a very good um, it, it's a it's a very good practice. I think for for the for the for the for the for the, for the viewers out there, you know, you you really ought to be thinking about you know how do I explain this to someone. It's right. like being married, Denny, right? You have to be able to explain everything. <laughs> well, I, 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 I use my, uh, my analogy, my litmus test is uh, uh, my parents, when I first got into IT, uh, I used to be, you know, I used to work at GM as a mechanic, and 
you'd be able to explain to your parents, and you know this, your parents, right, may not understand the technology. How would you possibly explain to them what you do or what you did? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the best story, and I've never, I've never told you, that. I'll do a real quick one. My dad was listening to me on the phone talking to some guy about a, a problem with his router, and uh, the ARP cache was the issue. And I said, you got, you got a cache issue, blah, 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 blah. We kept going through it, and we fixed it. And then my dad, after I get off the phone, my dad looks at me and goes, why do you care if you got a cache issue? Go to the bank. Why are you calling you for it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's a it's amazing it's amazing. So so um any um so so anyway um so so after you 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 listen to this uh, presentation there is a there's a companion paper that uh, Tony has written that is also in the in in the article and then um, as soon as we can we're gonna post uh, his presentation as well. Um, I, I have a feeling that uh, this is not the end of the end of the discussion. <laughs> nope. Nope. And and you know what? You know what I'm finding too, because this is this article hasn't been out for very long, but people are actually trying to do this stuff, and yeah. they are either pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised what they're finding. So every like every vendor, every configuration, everything is now starting to come out because people are actually doing it. Yeah, and, uh, and that's why I agree with you. This is this is far from being the end of it. <laughs> no, I I really appreciate what you're doing. I, I really, I mean, it just sometimes you, you kind of I, I you know it's easy for for me to talk about how we're beating. I mean, we 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 talk about this before we before we prepare for this article. I I ask the question, you know, why why do we beat the dead horse to death? Well, it's already it's, dead. It's already <laughs> dead. Leave it dead, yeah. right? Yeah, let it be. Yep. But but um. So it's it's easy it's easy for me to kind of uh, trivialize this, but and I really appreciate how you you take a different perspective. You say, look, let's how about we look at it this way? You know, mm -hmm. maybe that argument is is uh, how, however valid that argument is. Maybe they just try a different discourse. Yep. You know, talk about it. I, I really appreciate that. I really do. Thanks. Yep. That's yeah. that's why Denny Denny. That's why Tony is one of the best instructors that we know because he. He covers all the bases, and he doesn't. He's not pontificating. Um, Denny, you and I both taught college, and we know how that can be a huge roadblock to to education. Tony, you know, the, I don't know if you remember the old adage we always heard. I know when I was in my doctorate school, is I always heard the last question a person has unanswered is the last thing they remember, and. When Tony goes to classes, and I've seen him, he uh, he brings the questions out as if he's doing it for the first time, even though he's done it a hundred times, mm -hmm. and that engages people to ask questions, and that's how you learn. Like I'm delighted that Tony's already heard from people saying, "Hey, I'm trying this. Uh, you know, this is a, a first step towards knowledge." And yeah, uh, yeah and don't I mean, forget. Just one last thing, guys. I have taught college, college, by the way, so I have the same bad habits you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad habit is is I hate teaching things you know more than three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we have a bunch of uh, live audience out there. I, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, presentation. Uh, I I I think that uh, people really look forward to listen to you talking about this subject, Tony. And um, so uh, we'll we'll keep coming back. We'll keep coming back and present uh, you know more and more, and and because people really like this stuff. Cool. All wow. right. Okay, Tony, Tony. Thank you. You did a go great back, job, uh, Tony. Go back thank to whatever you. you're doing. You know, put, you know, time to change your pajama pen. <laughs> <laughs> and and no, you did. too, Tim. <laughs> no, I got my I actually got dressed today. I'm not like you, Denny. You, you know. <laughs> oh, jeez. Here we go. Hey, hey, wait. I got I got to do my usual thing on LMTV. All right. Denny's clock hasn't changed one second. Hey, you know how much effort I put in to make sure that it's, it's accurate twice a day? Yep. You go to great lengths to make sure that it's accurate. Okay. <laughs> All right. For those of you out there who doesn't understand this, you know, Tim has one leg. He doesn't, that doesn't bother him. But my clock <laughs> bothers him. All right. So with that, I'm going to close the show. It's not going to get any better than this. Um, <laughs> thank you again, Tony. Thank you, Thanks, Tony. Tony. It was uh, awesome, Tony. Thank it you. It was great. It was great. It's like the master chef working. That's right. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Bye bye. See you next Peace, week. Peace, everyone. Be safe. Whenever. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.